Richard, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, really. Amazing space. Uh, so... Oh, it's too loud? Uh, hello, 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 hello. Good? Okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so we'll be talking about Mimblewimble, about Beam, and the stuff around. Okay, so... Some people know what Mimblewimble is, um, so welcome. And uh, so today I'll talk about what is Beam. Uh, then we'll talk about Mimblewimble and how it works. Uh, then we'll talk about how we at Beam extend or plan to extend Mimblewimble and what happens tomorrow. Okay, so uh, Beam uh, is a new, totally new blockchain based on the Mimblewimble protocol with all the nice properties of original Bitcoin plus uh, additional stuff, right? So it's a proof of work consensus, decentralized, permissionless coin. It's not a fork of anything. We started implementing it from scratch in C++. We started in March, uh, launching very soon. You'll know soon how soon. Um, and the main, um, the main property of, of the protocol is that it's fully confidential and very scalable. And we'll talk a little bit uh, later how exactly this works. But uh, I want to start actually, and I was kind of thinking, is it the right place to start? I, I want to start with governance. Okay, uh, as Richard mentioned, there is uh, there are right now two implementations of Mimblewimble. There is Grin and Beam. So Grin is fully community funded, uh, meaning unfunded actually. It's all like volunteer effort with some donations. They've been running for about two years, doing a great job. Um, and we're actually using the startup model. We are funded by uh, VCs. Uh, and our, in our protocol, we have a 20% treasury in the first five years, meaning that 20% of the emission goes to the treasury and it's used to repay the, or to repay the, the investors to incentivize the team and also a large part is set away for a foundation which we'll be setting up uh, in the, hopefully in the first quarter. It's a long process, but the goal for the foundation is to actually attract reputable people from the community and govern the protocol in the years to come and eventually pass the governance to the, to the community in total. Okay, so now I want to talk about Mimblewimble actually, how it works and what it is. So. It's a really amazing protocol that was published over two years ago in August 2016 by somebody called Thomas Elvis Jettisor, which is Voldemort in French. Uh, so somebody very fond of Harry Potter, uh, obviously. Uh, and it's built on three pillars, okay? Uh, one is U the UTXO model. The UTXO stands for unspent transaction output. It's like, it's the same term used in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Think of it as just a bag of gold or bag of money. Uh, like if I send you a hundred something, then this is a UTXO. So now you have like a bag. Uh, then another pillar is confidential transactions. And the third one is cut through. Okay. So in Mimblewimble, there are no addresses. Okay. Unlike Bitcoin where you have an address and a wallet and you have your funds there. Uh, in Mimblewimble, uh, each user actually holds keys to their own UTXO. You can think of like a, uh, like a large room, a Harry Potter style, very large infinite room with a lot of saved deposit boxes, and you have the, the keys to your own, uh, your, 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 your safes, right? Uh, so each user has keys to their own safe, so there is no address. We'll see how we can send money uh, a bit later. Uh, so in reality, there are no safe deposit boxes, right? So the, 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 safe, the, the, met, the metaphoric safe deposit box is represented by something called Patterson commitment. Uh, there is actually a computer scientist uh, by the last name Patterson, and he, he invented this thing. Uh, and uh, the commitment is actually a sum of two numbers, one being the value and another one being my key, actually. Uh, multiplied by e the by two elliptic curve 
generator points, right? So what's nice about it, if, if, I, if I know those two numbers and I can tell them to you if I know the, the V and the R and G and H are public, then uh, I can do stuff, I can, I can change, I can pass uh, ownership to people. Uh, but if I just see the sum, you know, then, uh, then this is what happens, right? It's just from the outside, just total garbage, right? The, you look at this person commitment, you, you cannot really <laughs> make anything out. Okay, so now, okay, so we have this beautiful uh, set of safe deposit boxes. So, so what do we do, right? So, so uh, how do we pass funds from people? Okay, so how, how, the, how this transaction happens, right? So I'm Alice, oh, oh that thing is Alice. Right, she has keys to her three boxes, now she wants to send money to Bob, obviously. So what she does, and these guys are the blockchain, right, this is like, these are all the validators. Right, so she would take one of her boxes, one of her Peterson commitments, split it, and, and this is an oversimplification, but you will get the idea, right, this is, uh, and, it, and it works, believe me, the, the, the understanding wise thing, it, this, is, this is how it works more or less. Uh, and now she divides the, the safe into two. Right, because if she had a safe of 100 and she would want to send 50 to this guy, so she would have to create another safe of 50 and another safe of 50 for herself. Right, I mean, this is just one case. I mean, if, if she wanted to send all of her money, then she should, she, she would have, you know, connected all of them together, but this is, this is a good example. Right, now she sends that to Bob, uh, and then Bob replaces the key, right, on his safe deposit box, right? And they both sign this transaction. So it's, it's a very important property of Mimblewimble, by the way, and we'll touch upon it later, that to create a transaction, you need two sides to cooperate, right? So if I want to send you money, it's not like in Bitcoin, you just give me an address and I send it to you and it's done. In Mimblewimble, both Alice and Bob have to do something. So Alice sends this thing to Bob, Bob changes the key, signs the transaction, sends back, Alice signs again and then it's sent to the blockchain, right? So the downside is that both have to be, have to, to participate and come online, not necessarily at the same time, but uh, in, in around the same period of time. Okay, so what happens next, right? So now we need to validate that this transaction is okay, right? We have a blockchain, we have this public ledger, but it's not public, it's, it's kind of secret, right? Because all this looks like garbage. So what do we validate actually? So we send this transaction to the blockchain and these guys validate two things. One is that this sums to zero, that if I took 100, then whatever I took made out of it, uh, minus 100 is zero, okay? Because otherwise I would have printed money, right? Or burned money. But probably if, if I could, I would print rather than burn, right? Uh, so, and then there is another, a little bit trickier thing, but for, you know, people who are more uh, technical oriented here will be clear because I, uh, I need to make sure that the sum, uh, that the values are positive, right? Because otherwise I could take 100 and then uh, give, her, uh, give him 200 and give myself a minus 100 and then the sum would still be zero, right? So I need to validate that. So for, for uh, the first validation is done, just doing this uh, elliptic curve math, it's pretty straightforward. And the second part, uh, we're using some zero knowledge proof protocol called Bulletproofs, uh, developed by Benedict Bunz, uh that actually, checks that the value is positive without revealing or without showing the value, okay? So once those two things are proven, then yeah, we know that the transaction is valid, that whatever she had uh, was split uh, in, into several parts, the sum is uh, zero and no money was printed, uh, everything's all right. Okay, makes sense so far? Great, so now Bob has control of his funds and uh, Alice uh, has a smaller box. But again, from the outside, everything looks exactly, exactly the same. Okay, so uh, th there are no addresses in the system, right, as I mentioned. So, uh, however, in our UI wallet, uh, we still have this concept of an address because that's just something people are very used to when, when they send and receive money. So in Beam, an address is just a temporary token uh, which is used to start this conversation. And it's, uh, so what I would do, I would say uh, receive money, create a receiver address and send it over WhatsApp or email or whatever, like we do with Bitcoin today, right? We'd send it to the other party. 
and they will start this transaction. And in order to facilitate this transaction, we created, uh, because an original Mimblewimble um, protocol, actually the idea was that the two wallets have to connect directly using you know, direct IP connection and then do the thing online. But this is not very practical. Right? If you're sitting at home, you don't even have, it's very hard to, to open a, a port outside. Anyway, so we created something that's called the secure bulletin board system. So it's really like, think of a bulletin board. So I create an, an address, I post it, uh, um, on, on, on this bulletin board, which is running among the nodes. It's a, it's a distributed hash table based system. Uh, and then, uh, so Alice posts, posts a message uh, using this address and Bob, since he got this address on Telegram or WhatsApp, he connects to the secure bulletin board system and they start this conversation. Okay, so this is how the second pillar works. Okay, so we, we talked about the UTXO model, the safes, then we discussed how one safe deposit box becomes two and how this can be validated. And then there is, so, so, so up until now, we are actually talking about a blockchain protocol that is confidential, confidential transactions, very nice. Now there, there is one more thing to Mimblewimble, which makes it very scalable and it's called transaction cut through. In Mimblewimble, you don't have to and you don't store all the transaction history. What you do store is uh, you just store the current state of the blockchain. So I'll give you an example. So let's say Alice uh, sent uh, this, this uh, uh, whatever color that is, box uh, to Bob and then Bob sent the same one to Carol, right? So actually the system doesn't store this information, it just stores uh, that in the beginning Alice had that coin and then uh, Carol now has uh, this one, okay? So the intermediate states are cut through, okay? So what the blockchain actually has uh, is just the current state of all UTXO. So what the blockchain has, um, it has all the coin-based transaction, meaning all the mined coins. This information is public. Then it has the current state of all coins. And then it knows that the sum is zero. Okay, so we had an input, right, whatever was mined. And then it somehow was distributed between different people, but the sum must always be zero. So, and that actually leads to a blockchain that's pretty small. Okay, because it doesn't grow with each transaction, rather it grows with the number of those safe deposit boxes. And it's, uh, we made some estimations, we think it will be uh, at least three times smaller than Bitcoin, but it may be even much, much smaller, maybe 10 times smaller. Uh, just because the growth is not with the number of transactions, but rather with the number of UTXOs, which might, I mean, we'll need to see how it behaves, okay? Now, there is one more trick here, um, pretty technical. Uh, you know, the, the, so, so we just discussed that you cannot really see anything from the blockchain. If you observe it, you see, you see a lot of garbage. But uh, if you're very smart uh, and, and uh, very malicious, you could try to monitor the network and try to see uh, like where the transactions are originating from and where they are, not, it's, it's harder to see where they're going, but you could see like who is sending what and you could try to build a transaction graph. So to prevent that, uh, we implemented something called Dandelion and it's an obfuscation protocol which is somewhat similar to Tor. Uh, for those of you who know what Tor is, it's somewhat the same idea because in normally in a, in a blockchain in like in plain vanilla Mimblewimble, a node, uh, you know, a wallet connects to a node and the node just bro broadcasts the transactions to the network immediately to everyone. Now, usually people are running their own nodes. So meaning that, you know, somebody could see that your IP address was broadcasting stuff. So to mitigate that, uh, there is this protocol called Dandelion where uh, the transactions are not immediately sent to the network, but rather uh, probabilistically either sent out or passed to another node and then to another node. This is called the stem phase and then to another node. And then there is this fluff that's called the fluff phase. So then they're broadcast to everyone. So it's really very hard to try, trace everything. Now in every node, additional transactions are added to, to this, uh, additional safe deposit boxes are added to, to this uh, whatever is sent. So it makes it 
really very hard to understand what's going on, almost impossible. Uh, and if there are not enough transactions, actually this is our very specific piece, we're also creating like dummy UTXOs that are later removed. Remember like say in Monero where you have ring signatures for every transaction there is like a lot of fake stuff which stays there forever. And in this case we do create some fake stuff but it's just burnt, it disappears. Okay, so, so far uh, what I covered is like more or less how Mimblewimble works. Of course, you know, technically it's much more complex but we will not go, but the basic, the basic, this is the basic gist of how it's working. Um, some numbers, okay, about Beam. Uh, so our block size is one megabyte, block time is one minute. Uh, transactions per second, since we're a proof of work coin, are pretty slow, 17, so now we're near Visa and MasterCard, so and we're not claiming we'll be. Uh, the blockchain size per transaction, the conservative estimate is 220 bytes. Just to give you a comparison, in Bitcoin today, it's about uh, three times that. Uh, in, uh, in Monero, after their last update, it's uh, 15 times more than that. And in Zcash, it's like, uh, it's Bitcoin times, times 10, so it's like 30 times, 20, 27, 30 times like that. Okay, so uh, some words about our coin economics. Okay, uh, also some figures. Uh, so we have a cap supply. This is the number, uh, 262 million beam, and this huge number of growth. Now growth is named after Jens Groth, uh, a computer scientist, uh, who actually laid some groundwork uh, for zero knowledge proof. Uh, of course with his permission, and uh, we are, we're talking to him a lot. Uh, so, um, so the first five years, as I mentioned, the 20% of the coins are going to the treasury. Uh, and the minor rewards are 80 beam in the first year, 40 in, in two to years two to five, and then 25, and then halving every four years until the emission stops um, after 133 years. And I wish all of us to see that happen. Okay, so, so far, uh, I covered again the plain, the, the Mimble Wimble as it is, and now we'll go to Beam's longer vision, a little bit longer vision. So I claim that today's cryptocurrencies are not really usable for real, real world, real life, real business. Why? Because, uh, well, most of the currencies today are not private. Right, Bitcoin is not private, you know, you could try to hide stuff, but it's hard and cumbersome and then you never know who will find it because it stays forever in the blockchain, right? Now, who here would be willing to just print their bank account statements online for everyone to see? Probably very few people, right, if at all. Uh, now, think of a business that would, like, would a business do that? No, no way, right? Because it's, it hurts, it, it just hurts their competitive advantage. I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to imagine using money that is all public, right? No way. Now, and people understood that, right? And, and there are very nice uh, technologies, Monero, Zcash are great scalability problems. And if we come to compliance, Okay, try to do some Monero trades with some people and then try to come to, the, to a bank or to, and, and, and convert this money or, or prove where you got this money, no way. It's like, for a bank, it's like a black hole. I mean, they, they just don't want to touch it. Now, I claim <laughs> that the, the banks are not really going anywhere and the governments are not really going anywhere in, in, you know, anytime soon. And I, I don't want to even, if we want it, or them to go, you know, personally, I think there are some good things in, in, in you know, that we have uh, here, right? Uh, so, just, just to say that uh, a functional currency also needs to be compliant, meaning it has to have this option to come and report your taxes or come to your auditor and show your uh, transactions in, in, in this or that way, right? So while 
I believe deeply that privacy is a fundamental human right and sovereignty over your money, both in terms of owning it, right, not letting anyone else, you know, holding your own pri private key and owning it and not, not that not somebody else holds it, owning the information and deciding whether you want to be 100% private, which I really want to do with my personal money. I spend it as I like and nobody needs to, to know, right? But if I'm a company and I play ball with the system and I, I want to play ball with the system, then I need to have a way to come and report my transaction in approvable, in transactions in approvable, a nice way. And Mimblewimble actually it turns out that this protocol also can be tweaked, and which is what we're doing, and, and it can allow that, okay? Uh, and I'll show how we do that, okay? So since Mimblewimble, uh, as, we, as I mentioned, is a conversational thing, right? I can demand stuff. I can, say, I can tell the other side, okay, I'm going to send you money only if you do this and this, like in real life, right? Uh, if I want to pay something, I say, okay, send me an invoice and I will pay you, right? If I want to, if I want to pay just like that, no problem, but I decide. So, uh, so it's a familiar picture that we just saw and, and loved. So, but here we add a new guy. This is the auditor, okay? So what Alice does, uh, if she wants to, if she wants to, she creates a special auditor key, okay? And then she can give that key to, to that guy. Okay, so now when she sends money to Bob, she uh, puts, um, she has like a, a, you know, a contract maybe, so she hashes the contract, uh, a signed contract, and Bob has an invoice, and so they kind of hash those two documents, you know, create hashes of those two documents, and they create this envelope, okay, where the hashes are put, but, you know, as a metaphor, right, we just take this, the safe deposit box, we, we put the envelope, and uh, the envelope is, is locked with a key, Okay, whatever. I mean, how do how can you lock an envelope with a key? I have no idea, but this is the metaphor. Okay, so so then we send it to the blockchain, right? And the envelope actually stays there. And then when the end of the year comes, and Alice goes to the auditor, so she she he can take the key uh, and look up all of, all those envelopes that are that can be opened with a key. And then he just opens, opens the envelopes and sees the documents and validates them, right? And, and the, this procedure, when, when, when the auditor looks at her transactions, the, the auditor can also know that the, the lease is complete. This is super important, right? Because if I could just report some of my transactions to the auditor, then it would be a problem. So, so uh, the auditor will see that all of the transactions in this particular wallet are are valid or are, are you know have have the right papers and he can he can check all of them so when alice comes to say to a bank and and wants to prove the source of funds she can do that okay okay this money was received from this guy and this was bought on an exchange and this was uh, traded and whatever uh, so an important thing is that it's opt-in opt-in auditability right so if alice doesn't create this key there is no way even if i put a gun to her head to get the history of her transactions, right? Remember, remember, when the history is not saved. If I put a gun to somebody, somebody's head, I can get their private kid, can get their funds, but not their transaction history, because it just is not there. Okay. If she does this key, then she creates sort of a history that can only be viewed with a key, and then uh, she can be audited. Okay. So this is. One uh, a very important addition, again, and, and, and I see it as something that's sorely missing, this combination, as just showed, of uh, privacy on the one hand and compliance on the other hand, plus great scalability, it's something that doesn't exist. Okay, um, one more fun thing that we're adding, and there's a lot of talk today about tokenized securities and stuff, uh, like trading stocks or art or buildings on the blockchain. It's all very nice, but again, most of the solutions today are not confidential. So, which again makes a little bit less sense, right? So, you, you could issue stocks to, to different people, but uh, I don't want everyone, everyone to know how many stocks of this or that company I own. So, Mimblewimble allows for that, so, so we have uh, added support for 
creating additional kinds of assets on Mimblewimble on our blockchain and trading them. So, and the way it will look just like that, okay? So again, you, you see all those deposit boxes, but there may be kittens or, or whatever, stamps or whatever you want there. Okay, so this, uh, actually those two things, uh, the opt-in compliance and confidential assets are major pieces of functionality that we are adding to Mimblewimble to extend it and to make it uh, more usable in, in, you know, in the real world. Okay, so as I mentioned, we started in March and tomorrow we are launching our mainnet. Okay, uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m. GMT. So what we will have is, uh, you know, we'll start with Genesis block with proof of, you know, no pre-mine. Obviously there will be zero coins tomorrow at 2 p.m. But uh, in some time, there will be the first 80 and then more and more and more and more. We are starting with a graphical wallet for the three operating systems, Linux, Mac, and Windows. Beautiful wallets. We actually put a lot of attention to usability. Uh, and this is um, a, l a lot of crypto technology is very hard to use because a lot of those cutting edge projects just don't really care about the non-technical people who don't know how to run a command line thing. Uh, really, you know, poor, poor, those poor, poor people. And yeah, who, who, yeah, but you know, we care about them too, right? So we created this nice software and we'll invest more in that. Uh, we have both OpenCL and CUDA miners uh, ready. So it will start with uh, solo mining only. Mining pool will come a little bit later. Uh, so uh, there is the mining, well, you cannot see it really well, but it's bit.ly slash mine beam. There is a nice uh, guide for enthusiast miners. The mining is, uh, I think it's, it will mostly still be command line, although uh, the, built, the, the wallet was built in miner was also, will also be ready very, very soon. Okay, like fully graphical. Uh, so, that's the launch. We're obviously super excited about that. We worked, you know, as I said, since March. And, and obviously the last days are <laughs> very, very, very hard. So all the team is now uh, working. It will probably work all night and, uh, and all day tomorrow. Um, but uh, it's, uh, you know, and, and the date is not just, just a date. It's the, the anniversary, 10th anniversary of uh, Bitcoin Genesis block, right? So post-launch, okay, so what are we going to do? Uh, yeah, CUDA miner is actually ready, yeah. Uh, so this is done, so we'll do mining pool support and, and one very important feature that we'll release soon is uh, atomic swap with Bitcoin. It's very important, so so idea is, is that the people will be able to just uh, trade Bitcoin to Beam uh, without any exchange, just peer-to-peer -peer, uh, very easily. And then we have a very long uh, roadmap. This is just a, a snapshot. So mobile wallets, we already have like an Android uh, version that we'll probably release in beta pretty soon. Hardware wallets, super important. Uh, Lightning integration, this is something we're working on because as you remember, the, the transaction speed is very low right now. So you need a second layer solution and Lightning seems like a great thing. Um, Confidential asset stablecoin, because stablecoin is this kind of a confidential asset that can be developed. We're not going to run the financial side of the stablecoin. Somebody else will. But this is something we're really looking into. Uh, compliance that we discussed. And uh, importantly, we plan to be ASIC resistant uh, for 12 to 18 months. Now, the way uh, we're using Equihash uh, with custom parameters, it's, it's an algorithm similar to... Uh, what Zcash are doing, but we are using different parameters, so there are no uh, ASICs. Uh, and we'll probably do a hard fork in six months and then maybe another one in a year from now, just to give the ecosystem like a year to year and a half of uh, GPU mining and then ASICs will eventually come. Uh, and uh, with this, uh, my talk is over. Uh, this is the beam girl, by the way, uh, flying to the moon. And uh, questions, you're very welcome, please. Let's start with a really easy one. Why, why the name beam and the beam girl? 
Uh, yeah, so uh, we talked about that. So th there was no like particular reason for the name. It just sounded nice and and and, and easy e easy to remember. Uh, but this logo actually it has like sort of a story. So you see all those rays of uh, of different colors. Well, they're all white here, but they are supposed to be different on the logo here. Uh, and then what comes out is just white noise. Okay, so you have a lot of information coming in. And then it's just kind of mixed together and lost. So we, we wanted to, uh, to to convey this message of confidentiality of just white noise for an outsider. If an outsider look, looks at our blockchain, they just see white noise. They cannot make out anything. So um, the, the dark side of the moon. Uh... Yeah, money. Yeah, dark side of the moon, money. So there is also like some reference to Pink Floyd here, as you can see. <laughs> yeah. But their logo is different, so we obviously, we created it uh, on our own, yeah. So questions? I'm, I'm just wondering if, it's, if people aren't happy with the 20% founders reward for five years, um, which seems excessive, would somebody be able to tomorrow fork off um, Beam, create Beam Core or Beam Classic? Is that something, or have you done something like what IOTA did and even put something in the code which will sort of stop that from happening? Uh, so obviously some people are unhappy with, uh, I mean, whatever you do, there will be people who are not very happy with what you're doing. We believe in our model, right? So we believe that, you know, th there is this treasury that it will be funding, the the for that funded the development so far. That's why people invested in us and uh, that will continue funding uh, development and the foundation that we're putting together uh, in the coming years. And yes, people will fork, absolutely, absolutely. And, and th there's no way to prevent that. Uh, and eventually, I think it will be good because today there are just two member implementation, implementations out there, which is, I mean, I'm pretty ast astonishing. Why just two? I mean, it's such a great technology. So uh, there will be more, and um, and the more the better, actually. So yeah, people people will probably most likely fork us for the treasury. People will probably most likely fork Grin because of their emission curve, which some people criticize as well. And uh, you know, that's that's the world we we live in. And just quickly, did you, did you rush to get it out for tomorrow to make it nice for the ten year anniversary? Or was everything ready before tomorrow? So we, uh, everything was ready and is ready before tomorrow. Everything is ready today. We just added this CUDA miner today. We had everything else ready before. Our original plan was to launch in uh, 2018. Yeah, so we are like three days late, but I guess people will forgive us for that. Uh, yeah, so we, we thought it was a good date, uh, and we felt we are ready. It's we are in a good shape to to make this launch. So we have the, the mining, we have the wallets, we have the blockchain. Everything's tested and running. So uh, so we're launching. Uh, I thought Mimblewimble was something uh, uh, to help Bitcoin actually, um, but now you present it pretty much as a. Uh, cryptocurrency as, an, uh, as a new altcoin with Beam. Um, maybe I'm missing something. Can you can you give me some clarity on that? Well, uh, yeah. So Beam is a separate blockchain. It's it's not there to help Bitcoin or uh, it's a different cryptocurrency. Uh, in the beginning, when Mimblewimble appeared, some people were talking about creating like a side chain, probably for for Bitcoin, but it hasn't happened. Uh, I think there are some technical difficulties there that are very hard to overcome. Uh, so right now, the only way to implement Mimblewimble that is practical is, uh, is as a uh, separate blockchain. There may be, uh, I know Monero is talking about maybe implementing a Mimblewimble sidechain for Monero in the future. So we'll see how it happens. Uh, but yeah, what we're doing is uh, not aimed at helping Bitcoin. Everything is aimed at helping Bitcoin, actually. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's a great comment because uh, 
as, you know, as I see it, right? Bitcoin has this huge deficiency. The absence of privacy is just a gaping hole, right? So uh, the, uh, a currency that could, or, or a technology that could be better or overcome needs to be a privacy oriented uh, technology that has privacy built in, which Mimblewimble is. So uh, there may be a scenario in which Mimblewimble coins uh, actually overcome Bitcoin, uh, unless there, people find a way to implement privacy into Bitcoin itself. But so far, it seems like a daunting task and something that there's no solution out there to do it in, 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 a, in, a, you know, in a complete way, in a comprehensive way. Yeah, I had a quick question about the whole privacy aspect. Um, the whole opt-in auditability sounds pretty cool, but I'm, I'm wondering, and maybe I didn't get it, um, if people want to like use a really like a privacy focused uh, currency, don't you think that it might be a, yeah, a barrier if they know that they, they might pay someone and that person actually uh, uses the opt-in auditability so that their transactions are visible even though they don't want to be on the public chain? Okay, so uh, the way it will work is that if you don't want your information to be, you, uh, you have to put your information on the blockchain. Think of uh, you buying a coffee at Starbucks, right? So what happens today? Starbucks give you this cash slip. Do you give any information to Starbucks if you pay cash? No. So this is exactly the way it will work. And if any of in, your information can be stored on the blockchain only if you agree to put it there. But Okay, but then I don't get because, for example, company A uses a uh, beam. Uh, they have to they have to audit their uh, their transactions pretty much. But the transactions that they did with the uh, with the yeah the other parties will they also be visible then? No, unless this other party puts in some identifiable information that they can put in, right? So because you know if if I send money to you, I could I could sign anything I could sign any contract but without your signature it's worthless yeah but right? what if I just really don't want my transactions broadcast at all so uh, your uh, w what is in there will just have garbage oh, okay. I mean it, it's garbage because your transactions actually transactions are broadcast anyway right so and and a node can actually store all this, remember, remember that, uh, that every transaction is actually broadcast to the blockchain uh, in, in classical Mimblewimble as well. Just, why is it so slow? Okay, here. All these guys actually get it. Uh, just during cut through, it's, this information is mostly discarded. But if I have a node that for whatever reason I want to store all that, I can store all that, but it will be just a bunch of numbers. Uh, uh, like some, because again, there's no address. There's nothing really. So, so the way auditability will work, like the real world, if we sign a contract, then we both sign it. If I buy coffee, then only that part says, okay, I accepted four bucks from someone. They have to report, you don't, in this scenario. So we need to, and this functionality is very complex. We'll, it will take us probably half a year to, to build all the use cases and then to start you know, developing this in full. Uh, but, uh, and, and this is a good question. And right now, I don't have all the answers. We will need to understand all the use cases and how exactly they will be implemented. But there is a way, definitely. And this is badly needed. OK. Thank uh, you. One, one more question from here. Uh, considering we're both uh, friends of Grin, um, I really wonder why you picked uh, Equihash as uh, a proof of work algorithm. Um, we, uh, well, we wanted, we, we didn't want to innovate in, in that area, right? So Green actually had a lot of interest in creating uh, new innovative mining algorithms and they did a pretty good job. We didn't have uh, time and probably not the expertise of John Trump to kind of start uh, developing our own. So, uh, so yeah, so, so we just picked Equihash, we, we modified the parameters, um, and uh, yeah, so n n nothing more than that. Are you possibly alluding to something? No. You sure? There's no reason, there could not be some other reason why they, no? 
Not that I, I know of. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure from the answer. Anyway, any, any other questions? Anyone else? Yeah, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a quick one. Um, can you share something about the energy consumption of, uh, of beans? Uh, no, unfortunately, none of them. I don't have the numbers. I don't have the numbers. But I think uh, it's pretty close to, you know, Zcash. Which is, I'm, I'm not familiar with how energy consuming Zcash is compared with Bitcoin, so perhaps you could use that as a comparison. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have the numbers. But it, it will burn electricity, definitely. Hope, and hopefully we'll get to, as they say, Bitcoin burns the same amount as Denmark, so maybe we get to, uh, I don't know, to a smaller country first, and then, and then to Denmark. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Hold on a minute. Microphone is coming. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Thank you. I've got a um, slightly more from an investment angle, angle like uh, how much money uh, did VC put in? Uh, can you give me some of the names? Uh, how many did developers? And lastly, uh, what's the monthly burn rates? Uh, so the total so amount... So four, four questions. <laughs> yeah. So, I'll, uh, so, so to, in total we raised about $5 million. Uh, our investors are all on our website, so some well-known VCs. Uh, like one KX, A1, uh, UB Capital, Lemnus Cap, Node, and, and others. Uh, I wouldn't talk about the burn rate because uh, it's confidential. Um, and what was the fourth one, sorry? developers, uh, like, like, just to be as precise, like how many real smart developers um, do, do you uh, employ in, in, apart from the copy paste? Uh, so the core team, uh, the core dev team is seven, eight uh, developers. Uh, altogether we have uh, close to 30 people actually now, not everyone uh, full time. Uh, and uh, everyone is smart. <laughs> <laughs> everyone is smart. Is that it? Are there, are there more questions? We have time for a question or two. Anyone? Is that it? No? Okay. So uh, we'll get to, to, um, to hear from uh, Alexander um, a little bit later. At the end of the evening, we're going to have a uh, panel discussion on cryptocurrency and privacy. So um, uh, for now, we're going to have a pause, but let's, uh, let's say thanks and uh, with a round of applause for Alexander. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure. Thank you.